Okay, so I think we will get started. Um, I'm first of all very grateful uh, that you're all taking time out of your Saturday to, to meet me. Um, I know that this is in fact the last thing that you have to do today, SAS related, that is actually a, a course. I'm sure you have lots of work. Uh, but this is, I think, the only uh, reason you have to actually be at this physical location. So I acknowledge that and I'm very grateful for you uh, coming out today. Uh, in turn, I, I've tried to prepare what I think is a, a very interesting um, lecture. Uh, in English, we would call this a swan song. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard that expression before, it just means I'm very excited about uh, uh, this talk. So, so we'll see how it goes. Um, the title of today's uh, lecture is called Historical Materialism or the Tragedy of Inheritance. Um, and we can think a bit about what that means in, in the question period, uh, but I'll, I'll elaborate on it over the next week as well. So I, I want to do something uh, very specific today, um, which is that I want to think synthetically across a few texts. Um, I'm thinking synthetically first across three pieces by Carl Schmitt. You'll notice I didn't assign three pieces, so one of them I will simply explain to you. Those three pieces are Total Enemy, Total War, Total State. That's the first one. The second is Neutrality According to International Law and National Totality. It's the second piece. And the third is called Nomos of the Earth. Also, uh, what I'd like to do is put this into dialogue with Walter Benjamin, um, who you've encountered already if you've come to these uh, lectures before, uh, his theses on the philosophy of history. And if we have time, we'll also think about Benjamin's on their critique of violence. We'll do all of these things in the seminars, but maybe not all today in the, in the lecture. Benjamin and Schmidt were, were one-time collaborators um, before the, the Nazi party took control of Germany. Uh, so it's, it's not an accident that I put them together. They're in fact very much thinking together at the time they're writing these pieces. Uh, so that's the reason that we have this conjunction. And what I'm going to try to do is recreate uh, to the best I can the, the extent of this, this dialogue historically. These are motivated readings. Um, when I say motivated readings, what that means is that I'm not trying to be summative. I'm not trying to tell you everything you could possibly get from these articles. And the main goal here isn't actually to explain each one of these pieces as if you, 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 know, you hadn't read them before and my job was simply to tell you what they say. Uh, what I wanna do is kind of trace a problem that's consistent throughout them and that's consistent between Schmidt and Benjamin. So that's the goal for today is to kind of unearth a problem and see, in fact, how it mutates between the various texts. Now, the, the point of this reading is, is twofold. Um, what I'd like to do is, is first show you the problem with developing a coherent theory of war within international law. So the first part is showing you the problem of developing a coherent theory of war within international law, um, which means that even just war always appears as a kind of conceptual crisis within international law. International law has all of these provisions for wars that should be understood and manageable within the guidelines of international law. What I'm saying is that in fact, even with these provisions, even just war appears as a kind of crisis within international law. Okay, and, and of course, the second part is to show that this inheritance, I'm talking about the 20th century, that this inheritance is something that we still struggle with today. The questions I'm asking, I think, will be easily identified as, as questions asked around the clock right now, today. Um, even though I've not written this about any particular war, the total war is not a claim about any historical war or any present war. I'm dramatizing instead how 20th century international law copes with war, first point, and how we cope with the inheritance of 20th century international law. Second point. Okay. In the midst of World War II, Carl Schmitt, the German legal theorist, you've heard me mention before, I think, published a critique of the League of Nations, which is the predecessor to the UN, um, and its commitment to neutrality. He critiqued its commitment to neutrality. Um, not that it wasn't, uh, not that a commitment to neutrality is a bad idea, but that, in fact, it was not sufficiently neutral. Okay. The League of Nations was, much like the UN is today, designed to be a nonpartisan body, capable, because it was nonpartisan, 
of discriminating who has just cause for war. What Schmidt calls justa causa. And who is illegitimately at war. Okay, I'll give you a second to read this definition. We'll talk about it a bit in a second. First question I have is this. Why do we need, within international law, or just practically speaking, to distinguish between illegitimate causes to go to war and legitimate causes to go to war? And how do we do this in practice? This is a question to the audience. Why do we need to do this? What's the point of saying there's a legitimate cause, legitimate reason to go to war, an illegitimate reason to go to war? And how do we actually make these claims in practice? Fyodor. And can you stand as you... Yeah, sure. I think that if we are talking about uh, it in the context of law, uh, our causes should also be somehow stipulated or governed by law. So, the reason to go to war is probably uh, the violation of some charter that was signed, uh, and then uh, some parties didn't adhere to it. And at the end of the day, uh, that's why the thing happened. So, uh, I think this should also be the cause in the legal context, like the violation of some charter, some treaty or some agreement. Thanks very much. So, first uh, we have, I think, two claims here that, that come together. On the one hand, we believe that international law is based on actual agreements between nations, right? That when you create international law, what you're essentially doing is, as a community of nations, getting together and writing international law. And then second, that what international law does is arbitrate, judge, whether people have in fact adhered to the agreement made by, na made by nations. So that if someone does not adhere to this agreement, well then we have a violation of international law and that person is seen as illegitimately pursuing war. Okay, but we've also said that it is possible, at least in this logic, just a causa, to have a just reason to go to war. Something that would be not a violation of international law, but that would be in fact following international law. And, and we make these distinctions often, um, you know, historically and today, we say that, well, this person or this nation was right, in fact, to, um, I'll get to this in a second, but right to, let's say, defend their territory or go to war with this nation, and that this is also conceivable within international law, so that we can have wars that don't, in fact, violate international law, but seem to follow it. So I'll ask this question one more time. Why do we need to distinguish between legitimate and illegitimate reasons to go to war? And second, how do we do this practically? And Fyodor has already given us one answer. We can practically distinguish these things on the basis of violations of international law. What about those instances where we say, no one has violated international law, the war had a just cause, it follows international law? Any thoughts? What are we saying there, or how are we distinguishing the legitimacy or illegitimacy of war? Well, I think uh, still it's uh, maybe it, it, it depends on violation or not, but we usually consider legitimate as defenders and uh, uh, not legitimate and just as the belligerent like state. Very good. Nikolai? And uh, also, maybe we need to distinguish uh, in order to understand how is the outer world uh, reacts to the actions, like who, uh, whom uh, is the support should be provided and who is like who should be judged. Good. I, I think, in fact, we, we've come up with a kind of uh, consensus definition already of just a cause, right? We believe, in fact, that there is an outer world who has a valid uh, claim to judge an aggression uh, between, or a conflict between two parties or more, right? That an international community is somehow valid in judging this. And also that you can discern, and this is a very basic point, but we'll see how it becomes complicated, that you can discern between illegitimate and legitimate causes for war. 
one of the things we've said, um, and this is interesting because quickly in, in practical discourse, when we're not trying to be theorists of jurisprudence, but we're just trying to practically say who is right and who is wrong, this idea of justa causa mutates into a, a kind of common sense idea, which is something like this, that war is undesirable. And so justa causa seems to mutate into a problematic idea of aggressors and victims. Aggressor is seen as unjust on the basis of their aggression, and the invaded nation, a victim, is seen as just on the basis of their defense of their sovereign territory. So that we have this idea that it's, that it's quite easy, in fact, to distinguish between the belligerent party and the legitimate party, right? And that we can do this on the basis of who invades who, essentially, whose sovereign territory is violated. Likewise, what we're saying is that if you violate sovereign territory, you are doing something unjust. And if you defend your sovereign territory, that which has been violated, then you are just. Okay. The problem with interpreting justa causa like this is that invasion can be considered just and considered defensive if the invaded nation make some kind of claim or mobilize it in some type of way seem to first threaten the invading nation, even if that mobilization is not itself an invasion. And likewise, the total mobilization of a nation, preparations for war, can be seen as offensive, forcing the other side who did not want to mobilize fully to also mobilize fully in order to match what is perceived as an escalation. So here, a defensive and non-invasive gesture could actually be seen in terms of justa causa as illegitimate and belligerent, and an invasion could be seen as defensive and just. So already this easy metric for distinguishing between illegitimate and legitimate reasons for war goes through a kind of mutation in common sense, which is that we cannot always say that the invading party is the aggressor and that the defender of sovereign territory is, in fact, the legitimate um, heir to war. In other words, there's no easy way to use this idea of justa causa to distinguish between belligerent and legitimate nations. It's a problematic. Now, international law is, for Schmidt, supposed to be a true universal. A true universal. A set of rules that all nations must abide by that are not drafted by any one nation. What Schmidt calls nomos, the basis of law, is supposed to, in fact, precede, come before the constitution of nation states. In other words, the basis of international law is actually supposed to come before the constitution of these states, which we then say write international law. I'll explain how this works. International law is first the way in which the world encounters itself as a series of nation states in the 20th century. Disputes are disputes between nation states, and so on. In other words, international law constitutes the globe as made up of nation states, and those nation states may then appeal to international law. So the claim that Schmidt is making has very little to do with positive law. In other words, he's not saying that a, a group of nations, or even all of the nations in the world, get together and in fact draft international law. He's saying that international law, in its neutrality, is first the way in which the globe confronts itself as a series of nation states. So that in fact, international law is law between nation states. That's not decided by nation states. That's the reason that we can in fact have a sort of reciprocity or a coming together of nation states, which can then decide certain charters, which can then make positive law. When I say positive law, I don't mean good law. I simply mean the law that is actually written into being by nation states rather than the law that allows us to consider the world as made up of nation states. So this is an important distinction for Schmidt. It's the basis of his book, Nomos of the Earth, that there is in fact a kind of neutral law that is constitutive, that constitutes nation states, which can then be said to write positive law. In other words, he striates or separates two concepts of international law. The international law, which founds the international community, which says that the international community is made up of nation states, and the international law decided by certain nations or even all nations together as representatives of the globe. The distinction is between a neutral law, which is constitutive, 
founds nation states, and a positive law which is decided by specific nation states. This sounds backwards. It is not nations who write international law in the first instance. It is nations who appear subject to international law. In other words, if we say that international law is the reason that the globe confronts itself as a series of nation states ruled by sovereigns, then we can say that these nation states are first subject to international law before they author international law. They're subject to this neutral or constitutive law before they write any positive law. Okay. Now, the League of Nations was seen as a necessary arbitrating body because total states, i.e. states where there's a kind of complete identification between citizenry and the people. So if we wanted to talk about Canada as a total state, we would say that the Canadian population identifies as the Canadian people. This is not always the case. But it was believed in the 20th century that total states, this total identification, also would lead, in fact, to these states being able to marshal all of their resources towards a kind of total war, which was believed thereby to threaten the neutrality of international law. So the League of Nations is created to curb this ability of the total state to impose their own interpretation of particular on international law. International law must not be written by any state or any group of states. This is why it is neutral first before it's positive. And it was believed that total war, i.e. a state's capability to marshal all of its resources, in fact, threatened this neutrality. That what states wanted to do in waging a kind of total war was to rewrite the neutrality of international law as simply the particular universal, I'll explain this concept in a second, coming from one state. We encountered this, I, I believe, last time when, when I gave you this example. I said that in the contemporary moment, uh, we had a kind of American emissary complain to the UN that uh, the current political situation in the globe today threatened universal American values. Universal American values. So we see the problem with that statement. And this is, in fact, the anxiety that founded the League of Nations, that one nation or a group of nations would, in fact, impose their own interpretation of international law on the international community, and therefore their own right to judge whether people are abiding by that law. It's seen to violate neutrality, why? Because of course it is the product of only a few nations and does not govern all nations in the globe equally. Okay. And yet Schmidt says that in fact, it's not the total state alone that creates this problem. Remember that Schmidt's first article is in fact a critique of the UN's ability to maintain, sorry, of the League of Nations' ability to maintain the neutrality of international law. It's a critique. So he says that it's not the total state actually that creates this problem, the universalization of the particular. When I say again, universal American values, what we're talking about is a particular, something constituted in a very specific time and place with specific political ends that is then imposed on the world as a universal metric. That's what I mean when I say the universalization of the particular. So Schmidt believes that it's not the total state, in fact, that universalizes the particular. He argues that the League of Nations, meant to be a solution to this problem of a particular universal, in fact compounds the problem the second that it believes its function, the function of the League of Nations, is to discriminate who has just cause for war and who doesn't have just cause for war. The second that the League of Nations functions according to justa causa, it's believed that it invalidates the very basis of its ability to judge. I'll explain why Schmidt thinks this. So he says the following. The self-contained entirety of a single state does not present a threat or danger to neutrality according to international law. Rather, the danger comes from a suprastatal or supranational claim to decide the rights and wrongs of a nation on its own legal authority and on behalf of a universal. That makes it obvious that the universalistic claims and collective methods of the League of Nations in Geneva are what destroys neutrality in terms of international law. 
So this is a strange and kind of certainly not commonsensical claim that this gathering of different nation states called the League of Nations, designed precisely to determine who is following international law and who isn't through the metric of the justa causa, who is right to go to war and who isn't, right, actually violates the neutrality of international law. Okay. So nations at total war, and Schmidt admits this and we'll explore it later, also act like suprastatal entities. Suprastatal just means not a nation state anymore, but is in fact acting like a conglomerate of nations or acting like um, a non-state body, such as the League of Nations, right? This is all that suprastatal means. It just means above the state. So Schmidt believes that this is a problem for the, the state waging total war. But here, it's actually the discriminating function of the collective of nations, the League of Nations, that voids the legitimacy of their claim to represent international law. In other words, because this League of Nations gets together and believes that their duty is to discriminate on the basis of justa causa, who is right to go to war and who isn't, they are for this very reason not neutral and therefore cannot represent international law. This is Schmidt's critique. I'll say this a bit differently. The claim of the League of Nations to arbitrate on the basis of international law, to the extent that this means distinguishing between just and unjust causes of war, actually invalidates their claim, according to Schmidt, to represent international law. This is a paradox. I'll say this one more time. The claim of the League of Nations to arbitrate on the basis of international law to the extent that this means, again, distinguishing who is just in going to war and who is unjust, actually invalidates their claim to represent international law. So that the second that they start distinguishing just causes of war and unjust causes of war, they are no longer representatives of international law in its neutrality. This is Schmidt's claim. Okay. So why does he say this? It seems kind of contrary to all common sense at least the, the common sense we've inherited from the 20th century. Indeed, we still today talk about who is just in going to war and who is unjust in going to war, and just a causa seems to be the way that we primarily distinguish legitimate uh, uses of war and illegitimate uses of war. So it seems that we still have this framework today. Why would Schmidt disagree with this or critique this in the 20th century, and why hasn't that critique stuck? Those are the kind of questions that I want to answer today. First, I, I think what we need to do is to look at what Schmidt defines as a truly neutral international law. And we'll do this through thinking about what Schmidt defines as a just war. So what is a just war for Schmidt? For Schmidt, first, justice, just war, has nothing to do with judging or discerning and assigning legitimacy to, or illegitimacy, rightness or wrongness, to one of two parties, or multiple parties of the war. So for Schmidt, just war has absolutely nothing to do with saying this side is in fact in the right for pursuing the war, this side is in fact in the wrong for pursuing war. He thinks that this is actually besides the point that the second you do this, you are violating international law, not supporting it. Okay. For Schmidt, what defines a just war is the concept of justus hostis, excuse the Latin. Okay, I'll read this out, um, but maybe take a second just to read it first so there's no communication delay. So here, the just enemy is not he who has been judged to have a just cause, just a causa, by a third arbitrating party. A third party cannot, according to Schmidt, judge this because they can't both, one, arbitrate, and two, maintain a neutral position within international law that would validate the arbitration. So the idea here is that if you could actually maintain neutrality within international law, then you could legitimately judge just cause. Who is legitimate? Who is illegitimate in pursuing war? But Schmidt says the second that you judge, in fact, you forego, you give up this neutral position, and therefore the basis of your judgment is no longer valid. Instead, Schmidt proposes that just war should be defined in this way. A war which involves two or more sovereign nations who are, by virtue of their form, sovereign nations capable of declaring war. 
So remember we said that before there is positive law, which is the law that nations assign when they get together and decide international law, various charters and things like this, as Fyodor said, that there is first the constitutive and neutral law, the nomos in Schmidt, which simply meant this, that the globe is made up of nation states and that those nation states can then get together and draft positive law. So that, first of all, the neutrality of international law is formal. Formal. This means that international law and international meeting takes the form of various nation states meeting together, and those nation states have what? A sovereign, according to Schmidt. Okay. So there's a reason that what he's preoccupied with here is not any one nation state's ability to justify the reason they go to war, but in fact, the formal parity or equality of warring nations. So what would be unjust war for Schmidt? What do we think? If we say that a just war is any war that has two or more nation states that can therefore declare war on each other by virtue of being nation states, what would an unjust war be? We'll go one, two. Probably the war not between nation states. I mean, like uh, war in, in uh, the nation inside the country. How to say? A civil war? Yeah, that's right. So a civil war might be unjust, and, and this would be very difficult to determine in terms of international law. Harley? Well, if he says that a just war is the one between two nation states that, uh, well, two sovereign nations that can uh, declare war, then unjust would be something like colonialism against, uh, say, that, well, against a form that cannot, uh, so the one that cannot retaliate something that cannot uh, properly defend itself or something like that. Mm -hmm. And we actually see this argument in, in the 21st century quite a bit. Um, it, it's used uh, by uh, Hamas and other Palestinian institutions to distinguish between uh, Palestine and Israel as warring bodies. They say that this cannot possibly be a just war between these countries. Why? Because Palestine cannot be considered a sovereign nation, even though they, of course, believe it should be, right? So that we actually see this logic today, even if it's kind of counterintuitive, in explanations of international conflicts. Or if you have invasions of countries that are not considered sovereign, the territory is contested, you see the same kind of logic, that this invasion cannot possibly be legitimate because it is not a kind of formal parity between two sovereign nations that are capable of declaring war against each other. Okay, one point of clarification before we go on. Does this mean for Schmidt that both sides have to actually agree with each other that in fact there is a war and declare war against each other that usually doesn't happen in practice right you, usually that's a kind of uh, post facto thing right one country invades another country and then in fact oh there's a war and this is codified into being it's usually not the case especially today and you can think about american practices this way americans very rarely declare war on other sovereign nations they very rarely say we are going to war they just invade okay so in this way, we don't actually need both nations to have some kind of agreement that there will be a war before a war happens, and this doesn't happen practically speaking most of the time. It is just the case that there needs to be a kind of formal parity between the two warring bodies, two or more warring bodies, and this formal parity is that they are nation states with sovereigns, according to Schmidt. Okay. So, for Schmidt to say that international law is based on a neutrality doesn't mean that you have a group of nations that get together that pretend or at least try to be, you know, they actively try to be disinterested in evaluating who had the right to go to war and who didn't. For Schmidt, that's completely besides the point. In fact, nobody gets to discriminate just cause in a just war. The very form of the war for Schmidt is just. And therefore, the question of justa causa does not come into play. So he says there's, there's two things that, that we've seen so far. First of all, that this belief that um, you know, a few nations or more can get together and can say we are disinterested, we are not direct participants in the war, therefore we can arbitrate justa causa, who has the right to go to war and who doesn't. 
Schmidt says, one, that the second that you arbitrate, it actually invalidates that which would give your arbitration any kind of power, which is neutrality. And then he's saying, two, that we can, in fact, determine just war, and we can determine this formally. And it has to simply be that two or more nation states, which implies sovereigns, according to Schmidt, are warring. This is what determines a just war. It's a completely neutral and formal equality. Okay, a question. Well, <clears throat> the point of Schmidt is quite understandable about the just war and uh, uh, the sovereignty, but I cannot catch the reason why the arbitration uh, means automatically that they violate ne neutrality. I mean, that's doesn't it like what all judges in all law systems in the world do? So they just kind of neutral person who try to take into account all the facts and then make a judgment. So what's the problem with this arbitration, actually? That's a great question. What Schmidt is trying to do is distinguished between two kinds of law. What you're describing is positive law, that is we get together as a community of people, you know, we have elected representatives that in the legislature draft laws. And then of course we have a judicial branch which decides whether or not those laws have been followed. That's positive law in the sense that people have stipulated specific regulations and that there's another body or institution responsible for determining whether those regulations have been followed. So Schmidt isn't saying this isn't real. But he's saying that this actually comes after another kind of law, which is constitutive. And we can see this, uh, and we'll, we'll look at this uh, later in, in the week in terms of one nation, but we can see this in terms of the globe and international law. International law is constitutive and neutral in the sense that before any nation states can get together and stipulate international law as positive law, simply say, these are the regulations that we want the globe to abide by, um, and these are, in fact, the correct way to interpret these regulations. Before we can have any of that, we, in fact, need to have a world that consists of what? Nation states and the sovereigns that rule them. So before you can have any kind of parity, i.e. the ability of these nation states to then say, okay, we all collectively agree to these laws, you, in fact, need a neutrality, which is the fact that these nation states all meet each other in the globe as nation states. So there's two kinds of law that he's saying here. He's not saying that the ability of nations to uh, get together, let's say, you know, typically it's not the entire globe. It's just powerful nations judging whether, uh, you know, two or more sides of a conflict are in the right or the wrong. According to the laws they set out, they can absolutely determine if that's the case, right? No problems there. He's saying this violates neutrality because what is that governing body doing? Well, they can say they're disinterested, and that might be very true, right? Maybe they have no uh, kind of uh, stake in the outcome of the conflict. We can see this often. But what are they doing at the same time they're judging? They are taking a particular positive agreed upon metric and imposing it over the whole world. Do you see the difference here? That's why it violates neutrality. Not because in some way we have agreed to these laws and there's no way uh, to to impose them or judge them, which is a problem of positive law. But prior to this, the neutrality that says that all nations or that all um, members of the globe meet each other as nation states, that neutrality is violated the second that a conglomerate of nation states says, well, in fact, this will be the way that international law functions and we will decide whether or not international law is followed. That's where the violation of neutrality comes in. It's not a problem of positive law. It's a problem of the relationship between neutral law and positive law. Do you see what I'm saying? Good. Okay. So, justus hostis, this concept of the just enemy. You had a question, Harley? Okay. Maybe I'll finish my thought and then we can go to you, yeah? This concept of the just enemy means that war is not because of the rightness of the reasons of one party. That doesn't make a just war, right? The war is just because of the form it takes, statal war, war between nation states, according to Schmidt, and more 
it is just because it takes the form of a conflict between sovereigns, i.e. people actually capable of declaring war. So Schmidt says. So justice actually applies to both parties that are at war, not one. It's not a way of distinguishing who is right and who is wrong within a war. It is a way of saying if the form of war is in fact just or not. It applies to all of the parties in the war. Inasmuch, again, as they meet each other as statal, and inasmuch as the war is declared as the will of sovereigns, i.e. people actually capable of declaring war on behalf of a nation. Okay, so you had a question. Yeah, I see a bit of a contradiction with how he presents the argument. So he judges the idea of any benevolent authority being able to discern what is a just war and what is not a just war because it violates neutrality. And then he proposes his own idea of what is just form and not just form uh, by whether or not it is a legitimate sovereign nation. And yet, even if it is a, a conflict between two legitimate sovereign nations, we see quite often that it is not just against one or the other. The ability to declare war does not, in fact, cry into validity of war. Uh, and so, in this case, he kind of violates the national universal law between nations. Uh, again, the universal, I, I kind of get lost in the morning. Uh, what is his justification for, uh, well, his fault, uh, faulty system, uh, and yet the one that he proposes against the other one, I kind of... So his problem here is how we can think about international law as a true universal. That's what he wants, is to think about international law as a true universal. That is not a particular, an agreement among certain nations that has been universalized, but something that can be truly universalized between nations. That's the first issue that he sees here. Um, the second thing that I think, and, and so his, his answer to this is formal, right? He says that, well, one of the ways that we can avoid this is actually by avoiding um, positive law entirely. The problem with positive law is that you are always, in fact, universalizing a particular in as much as it is the product of the debate of certain nations imposing their will on the globe as a whole. So this is the problem he sees. The second thing you bring up when you're talking about the rightness or, or wrongness of war is, is kind of a conflation that we thought just a cause it would help us with, that Schmidt is saying it doesn't really help us with. The conflation between the moral basis of going to war, right? And then this idea of legitimacy or illegitimacy in international law. So one of the slippages that I think we often make is that international law is somehow supposed to judge and validate a moral basis for going to war or a moral basis for defending your territory and so forth. That when we say you are right, we don't just mean that you in fact are not violating international law. What we mean is that you have some sort of moral weight to your claim to defend, right? Schmidt is in fact trying to distance those two things. He's saying that, well, the moral evaluations are not things that can actually be maintained through this positive idea of international law. That is, if we impose a kind of particular and we say it is universal, and then we say, in fact, you have violated that, what we are doing is a sim simply accepting the moral framework imposed upon the globe, but not actually achieving any kind of neutral moral framework that would already be pre presupposed by these nations meeting each other as nation states in the globe. You're right, he does have something normative here, though. He says, of course, that there are nation states, right? The nation states make up the globe. This is not him. This is him thinking in terms of 20th century logic, the League of Nations, and then later the UN, right? So he has some kind of normative logic here. It's formal. But what he's trying to take pains to do is separate a few things. Neutral law from positive law, which I've already discussed, and then positive law from the ability to actually morally arbitrate. That is, just because there are these positive stipulations, charters, and so forth, does not mean that we can actually determine moral rightness or moral incorrectness on the basis of these. Yulia, you had a question. But like, why do we need neutrality to start with? In, I mean, imagine uh, before uh, any war, countries are agreeing on something, uh, and uh, they are all okay with this, even if one country like uh, divorce the other, but they're all okay with this. So uh, this happens, and they're like, okay, we 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 knew it we we knew it will happen, 
And everyone agree agrees on this, and there is no problem. So why do we need neutrality at all? Good question. Um, so one of the things that I always try and distinguish as I do these readings is that I'm not trying to tell you that Schmidt is the only way to interpret these things. I'm not trying to say that this is in fact the correct way to evaluate war. I'm trying to take an approach and then show you the problems with it and show you in fact what we can do on the basis of this approach. The second thing though, yeah, why, why do we need this to begin with? Well, first, I guess I have a question for you, which is this. We can say that consensus is achieved and that everyone agrees in a consensus, yeah? Would we say that there are no power relations in that consensus, that that consensus was achieved neutrally? I don't think I can imagine a consensus that's actually achieved without power relations, i.e. without some kind of coercion, right? It's very rare that all nations get together and agree on the same thing without any kind of power relations, economic relations, military relations in place. So that to say, well, the agreement is itself a kind of neutrality because everyone agreed to it, ignores in fact everything that comes before that, I think. The second thing, and this is just a historical example, is like, well, of course we have wars, and then what comes after war? Treaties, right? And it's seen and, and you know, largely agreed that the treaties, for example, of World War I, which we can say that every nation agreed to, right? In fact, spurred on World War II. So that consensus in itself doesn't really solve this problem and doesn't really stop us from, how do I say this? Doesn't really stop people from then wanting to break these consensuses, precisely because they say, oh, they were illegitimate. So what was one of the big reasons that the, the uh, Nazi party took power in Germany? Complaint about the Treaty of Versailles, right? That in fact, they say, well, we were coerced into this consensus. This consensus was not the result of neutrality. This consensus was, was the result of overwhelming power relations. That is, Germany was defeated in World War I. This is the only reason they agreed to the terms of Versailles. And so the consensus can be reopened precisely by saying, well, it was illegitimately formed. So Schmidt wants to avoid this, right? Schmidt believes that any consensus which is positive, which is the result of nations getting together, is a consensus determined by power. And he says, well, in fact, if we don't think about positive law first, but think about that which enables positive law, then we can form a different kind of formal equality or parity based on the very structure of what then defines positive law. In other words, based on the fact that nation states then get together and decide charters, treaties, and so forth. Do you see what I'm saying? So that's why I think Schmidt is committed to this idea of neutrality, because he does not think that consensus can somehow substitute for neutrality. Make sense? Okay. So the problem then, according to Schmidt, is that total war, nations waiting, waging total war, which we'll talk about in a minute, and those bodies that are put in place, like the League of Nations and the UN, attempting to mitigate against total war, all get this wrong when they judge the validity of war according to the validity of the causes given for going to war. They mess this up, according to Schmidt, when they focus on justa causa rather than justus hostis, when they focus on reason rather than form. Why do they mess this up? Because as we've already said, they conflate a variety of things. They conflate neutral law and positive law. They conflate positive law and moral basis. When we say that international law is what constitutes nation states, rather than nation states all agreeing to and deciding international law, we're noting the importance of a neutral form over the positive law that follows, which is what particular nations decide. Again, it's not a matter of choosing between the two. That's absolutely impossible. It's a matter of following a genetic process that is a step-by-step -step process that asks this question. How is it that nations can get together and judge on the basis of justa causa, who is legitimate for going to war and who isn't? And Schmidt says the only reason they can do this in the first place is because of a kind of neutral law, which is the fact that they all meet each other as nation states in the globe. Okay. So for Schmidt, the total state the identification of people and country does not in itself lead to any kind of particular from the state imposed as universal. That is that you can have total states, according to Schmidt, that don't desire to in fact impose their judgment, their system of law on the whole world. And yet total war as an operation on the earth, and we'll see another quote from Schmidt, as a kind of zoning of the earth, seems to threaten 
to universalize a particular and thus let one nation impose and judge, still illegitimately, according to Schmidt, its own conception of international law. Again, a conception that is positive rather than neutral, that comes after the constitution of the nation state and not before it. So it seems there are two issues here and they seem to be the same, right? That on the one hand, you have the League of Nations and later the UN that's put in place because of the belief that all of these nations, which are capable of total war, desire in fact to impose their particular understanding of international law on the globe as such so that American international law, universal American values become universal values that the American disappears in that. So it's believed that all of these nations capable of marshalling total war desire, in fact, to impose this. And so this is the rationale for the League of Nations and the UN. Schmidt says, hold up, there's a problem. The second that, in fact, you have this body, this conglomerate of nations, which thinks that it is capable of arbitrating on the basis of just a causa, who is right to go to war and who isn't, that actually you have the exact same thing you have yet another particular imposition of a universal. In other words, you have a few people, a few nations getting together and saying, this is how international law should function, and then imposing this on the world. You have another false universal, according to Schmidt. So do we see the parody he's trying to draw between that mechanism put in place, in fact, to stop total war, and then those nations waging total war, that they both, in fact, threaten to take a particular version of international law and universalize it. That's the critique that Schmidt is essentially trying to make, that the League of Nations doesn't solve this problem, it compounds this problem. Okay, how do nations do this? So we've seen in a way how a, a kind of a superstatal conglomerate of nations can do this just by saying we can judge who is legitimate in going to war and who is illegitimate in going to war. How do nations do this? Well, he has a great quote on this when he's talking about the sea warfare of England. He says, this is not just a means of warfare. It's not just that England has uh, you know, vast sea power in, in you know, uh, World War I and World War II, but that actually this imposes a kind of idea of international law just by its zoning of the sea. So he says the following. The English sea warfare is total. When he says it's total, he means that it actually changes our kind of spatial orientation. You no longer just have nations with boats, but in fact the supremacy of the English naval um, warfare apparatus changes something different. There is an Anglo-Saxon concept of the enemy which in essence rejects the differentiation between combatants and non-combatants, and an Anglo-Saxon conception of war that incorporates the so-called economic war. In short, the fundamental concepts and norms of this English international law are total. Okay, let's start with the end and then work our way back. English international law. Do we see the problem with that phrase? This is essentially the problem that the League of Nations is designed to mitigate against. That there appears to be, whenever a state is capable of marshalling total war, German international law, English international law, American international law. That is a gigantic problem in as much as international law is based on neutrality. We have a particular here that threatens to be universalized. Okay. What's he talking about when he's saying differentiation between combatants and non-combatants and the Anglo-Saxon conception of war that incorporates the so-called economic war? What do we think if he's talking about naval supremacy? Any thoughts? Say more, yeah. What do the English do in World War I and World War II? Well, they use their naval supremacy to attack merchant ships mostly, to in fact cut off the supply lines of natural resources to the countries they are at war against. What does this involve first? It involves a kind of economic war, right? In the sense that what are you trying to do? Cripple the nation economically so it can no longer afford to go to war with you, yeah? But the second thing you're doing is of course, you're attacking ships that aren't what? ships that aren't able to declare war, and ships that are, in fact, not military ships at all, right? Civilian ships. Merchant ships are civilian ships. 
So in this conception of English international law, it's not just that we have, um, for example, uh, English parliament that says this is how the world should be run. Actually, the warfare apparatus says some other things about international law before anyone decides these things. So it's not a consensus of people in the English parliament that says the world should look like this. It's actually the very apparatus of warfare that determines this. What do they say? That there's no distinction between combatants and non-combatants. What else do they say? That there's no distinction between economic war and military war. Okay. These are in fact claims about how different nations and different people can meet each other as warring nations. When we say there's no distinction between civilians and military personnel, when we say there's no distinction between economic war or sanctions, right, and actual military war, that's a specific claim about how the world comes together as a series of nation states, right? And it's not a claim made by anyone in positive law. So another reason that Schmidt cares about this idea of neutral law, the constitutive law, is that what we're saying here is that this takes effect before anyone decides that this idea, this particular, that's universalized, if the English win, in fact, takes effect before anyone says there's no distinction between combatants and civilians, or there's no distinction between um, economic war and military war. This is, in fact, how the war is waged, and it's also in itself a claim on how the world meets each other as a series of nations that can then go to war. Do we see this? It's not declared by anyone. It's just a fact of the war itself. It's not decided by English Parliament. It's not imposed as positive law. It actually comes from the very structure of the war. Is this idea understood? Sort of. Do we have questions about this? By dint of these ships simply attacking merchant ships, not by dint of any declaration of people in Parliament in England saying that there's no distinction between combatants and non-combatants. The very attacking of these merchant ships is in fact a claim about the way in which sovereign nations can wage war against each other. And that claim is that there's no distinction between combatants and non-combatants on the one hand, and that there's no distinction between economic sanctions and actual military aggression on the other hand. So clearly that's very particular. We can tell that's particular, why? Because we completely distinguish between those things today when we talk about war. We don't say that sanctions are going to war, right? We typically say that sanctions are what you do when you want a country to stop being at war. Yet in this idea of the, the kind of uh, prevailing international law of England in World War I and World War II, as it threatens to be a total power, we have a completely different conception of international law. Yulia. Actually, I don't quite understand the idea because for I, for me it seems like, uh, for example, uh, civil, civilian ships are under attack uh, and uh, then um, we can actually, after that, after war st stopped, we can distinguish if it's something uh, okay to do or not okay to do. And for example, we distinguish that it's not okay to do. And for from then, from that point, we are going to use this rule. So why can't we? So just so I, I have you right here, uh, are you saying that the reason that there's no distinction between civilians and combatants is just because a law hasn't been created to distinguish between them and that we can only do this after we see the consequences of it? Well, I guess I would say that like it's, as a military policy to say attack all ships, you know beforehand that some of those ships are civilian ships, some of those ships are mer merchant vessels and so forth. You don't learn this afterwards, right? So yeah, uh, the, the other side of this, which I think we should talk about in a minute, and you're anticipating actually uh, some of the things that I want to say later, um, is that we do in fact justify war afterwards and who justifies it? Well, the victors of war justify it, right? But I, I think that it would, it would probably be naive analytically to say that there's no distinction between these people just because of a lack of knowledge until after the war, right? That, you know, like let's say in, in non-war times, right? So between World War I and World War II, England can clearly distinguish and shows it's clearly capable of distinguishing between merchant vessels, civilian or exploratory vessels, and military vessels, right? 
And there's all of these domestic policies that, that indicate that these are different things. And yet when it's time to go to war, it seems like that knowledge goes out the window, right? All I'm saying here is that this doesn't rely on, you know, like Cromwell or Winston Churchill or someone like this declaring as a matter of law that there is no distinction between those people, right? That when we talk about positive law, we say a group of people get together and decide that this, is, this thing goes into practice and then impose that, right? Before that happens, we in fact have these different claims about how international law and just war should be regulated that are just the product of the actual military capacity and military function of certain nations. So here, the claim, according to Schmidt, is that we have English sea power, which in its might does not distinguish between these vessels, right? Not because someone has decided that there is no distinction between them in law, but just as de facto, as a matter of course, right? And that this actually has implications for international law. That's the only distinction that he's trying to make here. It's not positive law. It hasn't been declared into being. We haven't actually said that there is no distinction between these people. And yet, de facto, in terms of military operations, you've already performed a kind of zoning function and you have faced the distinction between those groups of people and faced the distinction between military, um, military war, right? What we would call war and economic war, what we would call sanctions today. Does that make sense? Good. Okay. So in the English case, when we talk about English international law, we clearly have a kind of universalized particular. I think that's very easy to see. English international law. There's a problem with that statement. We can all intuit it right away. This happens both with total war but also happens with third parties whose job it is to discriminate who's just and who's unjust. Just a causa. Schmidt says that these are all in fact about universalizing a particular. So he sees once again the same problem with English international law as he does with a group of nations, in the League of Nations in this case, getting together and saying, you in fact are just in going to war and you are not just in going to war. He sees the same problem that both are in fact universalizing a particular. They are not respecting the neutrality of international law, which according to Schmidt is the only true universal. Okay, but Schmidt says something further, and I, I wanted to dwell on this for a bit. I, I want to hear, first of all, um, your interpretations of why he's making this claim. So, so the first thing he said is this, that when we have these arbitrating bodies, we have something suprastatal. Sounds like a complicated word, really not, just means above the state. That where we believe in international law, the world should be, in fact, uh, a communion of nation states with sovereigns, yeah, who all decide on the basis of their nations. That here, when we have something like the League of Nations as an arbitrating power, we actually violate this and we have something suprastatal. Okay, he's going to make a second claim about this idea of the suprastate, and he's going to use some interesting language to do it. So what I'd like to hear after we read this is, is why he describes it this way, or what you think. Okay, so Schmidt says, it is characteristic of the indirect power, in this case, the League of Nations, that without waging war itself, the League of Nations imposes sanctions, it judges, it does not wage war itself. But by virtue of a supranational moral and legal authority, this conflation we talked about between positive law and moral basis, it takes it upon itself to decide what is legally and morally permissible and what is not in the showdowns between states and nations. As a consequence, the non-discriminatory war, which is the justus hostis, between states changes itself into an international civil war. Okay, so my question for you, why civil war? Why international civil war? First of all, that feels like a contradiction in terms. Civil war is what? We've already said, supposedly domestic, yes. A problem within a nation, or so we believe. And here we're calling this an international civil war. And we're saying this has something to do with the UN's ability to arbitrate conflicts, to decide who is just and who is not. It becomes an international civil war for Schmidt when we violate justus hostis, 
when we are no longer thinking about just war in terms of a formal parity between nation states, but when we are thinking about just war in terms of reasons for war and therefore determining who is right to go to war and who is wrong. So why would this become a civil war? And by the way, there's not, this isn't a trick question with the right answer. Um, this requires an interpretation, which I'll give you, and it's only one answer. We could have many. Did you have one? Okay, so as I see that, we call it international civil war because we're talking about some universal international laws which are going to be required to every country. And if every country follows it, it means that we become a big government together. So we kind of can we kind of can be the big government of all the countries, all the nations, all together. But because we have conflict inside inside of our big community, it becomes a civil war. This is how I see this. That's a really interesting idea. Okay, so on the one hand, we believe that when we have this kind of conglomerate of nations, that the second that these nation states come together, in fact, and decide as a community of nations. They cease to be what? <laughs> they seem to cease to be nation states, right? That the very basis of international law, the neutrality of international law, which is the formal parity of all of these nation states as nation states, seems in fact to be erased or violated the second that these nation states come together and say, we are going to create positive law, we are going to decide on the direction of the world, and we are going to, in fact, create a set of regulations that are interpretable and enforceable for how interna international law should be governed. Okay, so the first part seems to be that we have a kind of conglomerate that is no longer based on nation states the second that these nation states come together. The second part of this is of course that we never, as we said, have a kind of consensus that's not based on power relations, that's not in some ways semi-coercive, and that is not for that reason reversible, right? that it seems that all of the consensuses that we create are reversible, are challengeable. Okay, so we have a civil war because in this conglomerate, the consensuses that we achieve are always unstable, are always mutable, are always historically specific, and are always contestable. Did you have a point? But, uh, well, I guess uh, all the second year students here uh, read uh, the perpetual peace by um, by Immanuel Kant and um, his general idea about this peace was to create a kind of government for all the governments so because that's actually the source and well if uh, we were able to create the source of power that could uh, control the particular member of society and could regulate how they are interact so we actually create a community from just uh, wild animals actually so um in 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 the idea of schmidt uh we kind of and uh, well and despite of that we still have crimes and uh, de uh, and deaths we kind of made made this uh, made this right so uh According to Schmidt, this positive, uh, if I'm saying like right, so this positive law, this idea of the source of power that can control other members of society, I mean all other states, so th this source of power is actually the unity of states. And uh, so this idea of control is wrong or is it like, uh, well, not not judge and judge unjust, but is it like ineffective to create uh, the society with the peaceful, peaceful world society, or or how it works? Mm, that's a that's a really great question. Um, and thank you for bringing up Kant to to do this. Uh, I'll, I'll answer this uh, by virtue of a much more contemporary uh, source. Um, and and I think you may have encountered this as well. You'll tell me if you have or haven't. Um, which is uh, Francis Fukuyama's uh, End of History. Has anyone read this? 
okay, well, this is a particular take on globalization. Um, because what is globalization supposed to do? <laughs> supposed to unify, right? And globalization implies what? That we have a globe that supersedes any particular nation, and that if we achieve some kind of globality, that it is in fact not, how do I say this? That it is in fact what is common to all nations, and therefore what could govern all nations. And so Fukuyama's point is basically this, that we no longer, because we are tending towards globalization, and he's writing at the turn of the century, the 21st century, that we no longer have to worry about this problem of the particular and the universal, because in fact we are tending towards a universal already in globalization. Okay. Schmidt doesn't disagree that there can be a kind of consensus that we could, let's say that you know we're political theorists and we want to create a model and we say that uh, we want to create a model of consensus that isn't based on power relations and that isn't coercive. Schmidt thinks we can absolutely conceive about this, conceive this, right? He, but he thinks that the second we put this into practice, because who's putting it into practice, particular nations, right? That in fact, something changes, something fails. Okay, how do we see this with globalization? We today are entering a moment of not globalization, but a kind of willful detachment from the globe, right? That it is not seen that the globe and the values of the globe represent the values of all countries equally. And that the globe is not really seen as a kind of valid basis to judge the destiny of certain countries today. So you have, for example, an Islamic movement, right, which uh, involves a variety of countries that are trying to say, no, in fact, these values, which are supposed to be global values, do not represent us. We see this in a lot of countries. Russia is going through a similar thing right now to saying, in fact, the values which are supposed to be global are not our values, right? That, in fact, they are not global values. This is the second critique, right? It's not just that we have different values. It's in fact that these values, which we call global, are illegitimately global. So what's the critique of globalization today? I'm, I'm sure people know. Is globalization truly the achievement of a kind of universal metric to measure everyone? Not really. What's it usually described as? I believe the term is McDonaldization. <laughs> yeah, uh, um, very eloquent term. That is exactly right. It's described as the McDonaldization of the world. Um, where does McDonald's come from? America, yes. So that global values today and globalization is actually seen as the illegitimate particularization of American values or what we could call Western values, right? This is the critique of globalization. This is, in fact, the reason why I want why people want to pull away from the globe. This is the problem with saying, oh, we can all get together as a kind of uh, you know, community of equals and set these destinies for ourselves. Schmidt says, okay, we can conceive of this, right? But that this almost never happens in practice. Great example is globalization today. So Fukuyama believes that actually globalization will be the end to all particularity and the achievement of something much like what Kant is saying. 20 years of hindsight tells us absolutely not the case, right? There's a reason we have a kind of deglobalization movement today, and it's precisely predicated on the same problems that Schmidt is talking about in the 1920s and 30s. Okay, so when I say at the start of this that we have to grapple with two problems, one, that it's very tricky, in fact, to describe just war today in a coherent way, and that two, this is the inheritance that we have in the 21st century, that we are still using these frameworks and that we still have these problems. The second we think about something like globalization, I think we see it in, in a second, yeah? Okay. Other questions, comments before I continue? Okay. What characterizes civil war? We've said a few things. There's a kind of conflict and we have now a territory which seems to be shared. So we said that two things happen, um, extrapolating from your point, that one, whenever the League of Nations decides to get together as a League of Separate Nations, that in fact we seem to have a conglomerate that has nothing to do with nations. Um, this is what uh, Schmidt calls the suprastatal, right? And on the other hand, this conglomerate seems to be torn apart, barely hanging on, torn apart by conflict. Okay, 
What is a civil war, just in formal terms? Well, it's the suspension of law, first of all, the suspension of law because of mutual claims on a territory that come from within it. So if you think about the American Civil War between Republicans and Confederates, what characterizes it first? The suspension of the rule of law, right? That is the Republicans, uh, sorry, the Confederates no longer recognize what is now conceived of as the Republican rule of law, i.e. what was once universal when America was unified is now seen as particular, right? And with this, there is a separate conception of law, a Confederate conception of law, that is imposed on the same territory. So what characterizes a civil war? Well, something very specific. It's war, and so of course you have the suspension of regular law, yeah? But it's a civil war, and so why do you suspend regular law? Because you have two equal claimants to that territory, and therefore two equal claimants to establish law. Do we see the issue here? Why two equal claimants? Well, in a civil war, there are two or more sides. If it's truly a civil war and not just a, a rebel group against the government or something like that, we call it civil because they both have some kind of claim to the territory. Okay, so we suspend the law, which is suspended because now it's seen as the law of a particular group and not in fact of the nation, which is now not a nation at all, but in fact a site of conflict, right? We suspend the law because of the civil war and yet, why do we suspend the law? Because now there are two competing conceptions of the law or more. In the American context, there's one of the Republican side and one of the Confederate side. And these both claim to be simply American law, not Confederate law, not Republican law, but American law. So again, we have this idea of the problem of a particular that is universalized. And we have two steps here. The Civil War is initiated because what was agreed upon before as a kind of universal law, i.e. American law, now becomes Republican law. So the Confederates say, well, in fact, no, that is not, uh, in fact, how we interpret the Constitution. And in fact, we don't believe that America should be constituted this way at all. And so what was called American law now is actually just the, the um, how do I say this? Just the whims and providence of one group. Okay, first step. Second step is that we have now two competing ideas of law, Confederate and Republican, which both want to be simply called American law. All right. The problem then with this idea of universalizing the particular in an international context is that there really does appear to be a conflict now, not of two discrete territories, which was exactly the basis of the justice hostess, that you had a conflict between two discrete territories, which were discrete, in other words, separate, because they were separate nation states and had separate sovereigns. Now, it seems that you don't in fact have this at all. What do you have instead? One ambiguous territory with competing claims that are both equal within that territory. Okay, so it seems now that this problem is actually changed the second you involve something like the League of Nations into a problem of two sovereigns that claim the same nation. This is why things like annexation happen. So we see that, you know, real historical precedents to this all the time, that what happens when two nations go to war? Well, oftentimes one nation absorbs another part of the nation it is at war with, yeah? This happens not because of justice hostess, which respects the discretion of nations and the fact that each nation can, in fact, declare war. This happens because of this conglomerate where we are no longer thinking of individual nations going to war in the form of nations, but are in fact thinking of something much more complex, suprastatal, according to Schmidt. Okay, so the problem of neutrality, sorry, the problem of international law here and its corruption, which is a violation of neutrality, actually sublates, that is, changes into this. We start with a question of international law. And the second that we say this can be arbitrated according to the League of Nations, Schmidt says, the problem transforms, it's sublated, into a question of domestic law and its suspension in a case where two sovereigns have equal claim to the same land. In other words, what started as a problem of warring nations becomes, as Schmidt says, 
a consequence, the non-discriminatory war between states changes itself into an international civil war. So the framework he's using, this framework of justus hostis, is the second we apply justa causa, i.e. a group of nations or more imposing a particular and saying it is universal and judging those warring nations on the basis of this. Schmidt says the problem changes from one of international law to one of domestic law. I want to think about why this is. Why does now he use the idea of the civil war, a domestic problem, to talk about what is supposed to be an international issue, what is supposed to be a global issue? What do we think? Well, basically because it involves, uh, well, the states that are uh, judging just a cause uh, and uh, the states that are in war, they are not the whole, um, they not represent the whole, uh, the, the globe. So this is why they are local, they have certain territories, certain governments, and they are actually certain people. That's why it's uh, considered as civil. Let me clarify some terms quickly before uh, we hear from Yulia, which is this, because I, I don't think I've sufficiently said this, that on the one hand, we have a superstatal entity, which is the League of Nations, a particular nations getting together and imposing a particular idea, positive law, and saying it is international law. But the consequence of this, according to Schmidt, seems to be that we can no longer consider those warring nations, let's say it's two nations, as discrete sovereign nations, as in fact discrete entities. So that international civil war isn't just this conglomerate of nations we call the United Nations, which now seems to be super statal, but actually seems to be the way in which this war between two nations, justus hostis, is transformed into something else. So that what appears as an international civil war is not the nations deciding whether one side is right and the other side is wrong, right? What appears as an international civil war is the actual conflict they're arbitrating. That is the conflict which was between two nation states and which now seems to have transformed into a domestic problem between two sovereigns with equal claim to the same land. So that's what Schmidt is saying here, which is a very complicated concept. I'm wondering if we have thoughts on this. Yulia. Well, maybe just the fact of the existence of international law itself uh, connects, connects countries uh, inside the, like, um, inside the globe. And uh, the fact of the existence already uh, connects them and unifies them and uh, make them, makes them the same in some sense. And that's why they, it becomes civil, because they become more and more like one country, not many. I think this is a great idea. This is we, we said this already about English warfare, that before anyone decides that there's a kind of indistinction between non-combatants and combatants, that this is already put into practice. Here we're saying that by the very formal gathering of these nations, the League of Nations, as a superstatal entity, we're also transforming our idea of the rest of the globe, right? Which is that it no longer seems to consist of these discrete states, discrete meaning separate, that have a sovereign that is capable of declaring war. It seems actually that it's just a civil war, a conflict between two sovereigns who have equal claim to the same territory. I think that's a great way to put this. Okay, so this should be pretty obvious now, which is that when we have this conglomerate, the League of Nations, we can no longer apply the idea of justice hostis. Why? Please. I think that because when we talk about justice hostis, we talk about two separate governments. And yeah, in your case, it's gonna be one, one universal thing together. And there are there are no two universal governments anymore. So that's why we can apply this. 
So this is another reason that Schmidt wants to distinguish between neutral law and positive law, because he says the second that we actually put this positive law into effect, that formal equality of neutral law is violated. And he says we can see this in very practical ways. Well, we can no longer actually use the concept of justice hostis, which was a formal and neutral concept, which just said that a just war was in fact war between two discrete sovereign countries. That in fact, it's impossible to apply neutral law the second that we universalize a particular. So that there's a reason analytically to distinguish between neutral law, this constitutive law, and positive law. And the reason for that is that the second we think only about positive law, or the second we start only with consensus, that in fact we don't understand that this consensus is actually performing an operation on something that comes before it. It's actually making a claim about how the world should look before anyone says how the world should look. In other words, once again, it doesn't matter if all of these countries get together in the League of Nations and say, we are invalidating the concept of justice hostis. Why doesn't that matter? Because they're getting together already invalidates the concept of justice hostis. That's what Schmidt is trying to say here. Okay, so I realize that this probably should have been like a three hour lecture, which would be excruciating for you and I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do this to you. Um, and what I'm going to do is just focus on one last passage. What I want to do here, and then I'll have some questions, uh, just general questions, is think about a claim that Walter Benjamin makes, a very famous claim in his theses on the philosophy of history. And this is going to be a way, I think, for us to problematize the relationship between justus hostis and justa causa. Okay. Does anyone recognize this? Okay. Benjamin says in his theses on the philosophy of history, the nature of this sadness stands out more clearly if one asks with whom the adherents of historicism actually empathize. The answer is inevitable with the victor. And all rulers are the heirs of those who conquered before them. Hence, empathy with the victor invariably benefits the ruler. Historical materialists know what that means. Whoever has emerged victorious participates to this day in the triumphal procession in which the present rulers step over those who are lying prostrate. Okay. Loaded passage. Um, people summarize this actually in a, in a very basic way. I don't think it just does justice to the passage, but we'll do the same thing here today. They say this, the victors write history. Have we heard this before? Yeah, right? <laughs> okay, so maybe uh, we haven't heard, in fact, the referent, but we've definitely heard this phrase, the victors write history. What are we trying to say when we say that, the victors write history? Ideas? <laughs> that we should name our kids after the victors and we should identify, in fact, with the victors. Other thoughts? Please. I think that <clears throat> if you talk about that victors write the history, it kind of gives the cultural the cultural code to the specific place, to the specific like nation um, about this. So they have this like national trauma about what happened to them and how did they defend their land. And also I think it's gonna affect the relations between uh, the government and the people who live there. So I think that because of this victory, um, the government will take a lot of things on themselves. So they will, how to describe that? <laughs> um, they, will, they will try to show that it's all because they work this way. It's all because the system works like that. And that's why we made it. Otherwise, there is no way how we could do it all, how we could do this. Only this way works. And I think the government will stick to this approach forever and they'll use it for every other situation. It will say, so you know, in the past we did this and it worked. So that's why it's the best model which we can use right now. Thank you. I think that's totally right. And um, maybe Nikolai, uh, just for the question period afterwards, I'll just finish one idea and then I'll, I'll open this up to questions. We primarily think about this phrase, the victor's right history, in terms of ideology. One great way to understand that is that typically when we're telling ourselves about uh, you know, the war, 
whatever war it is, World War II in a Canadian context is, oh, well, we did this so that Canada, Canada could exist today, right? America has the exact same claim that, oh, well, uh, you know, America participated in World War II so that they could have freedom today, uh, whatever that means. Um, what they're saying essentially is retelling a kind of creation myth of the nation, right? creation myth of the nation, that we have the nation today because of these actions we made. This is seen as primarily ideological, right? That this is just, in fact, uh, you know, a myth and a way of convincing a population of the rightness of what has been done. I want to think about this a bit differently. So the victors certainly write history in terms of having the dominant ideology. If you want to call America the victor of globalization, you simply mean that, well, globalization's values are primarily American values, right? And that could be ideological. But I think we mean something a bit different, too. Um, so my question is, is this. Where the victors write the history of the vanquished, this is what we've seen in Benjamin, where the victors seem to write the history of those they've vanquished and write it as the triumph of justice over evil, because this is how the victors write history. Are we not talking again about justa causa? Now, not in terms of who is legitimately going to war and who isn't, but in fact, as a way to understand a war that has happened post facto. Justice hostess is how war should be conceived in international law, says Schmidt. But when the war is over, a country is either subdued or victorious. And on this basis, the victor is able to explain or not that war in a different form. I'll give you an example. So the US is, is quote unquote victorious in World War II. It explains this quite literally as a triumph of good over the axis of evil. That is literally what the subdued countries are called, the axis of evil, right? Rather than restoring the sovereignty of Germany and Japan, it essentially makes them into client states, purposely keeping down the value of their currencies so they can actually export goods to America. So victory here seems to be the imposition and validation of a single justa causa, the rightness here of the victor, over a territory that no longer appears able to claim the status of justus hostis. What are Japan and Germany barred from doing for decades after the US occupation? Declaring war. Okay, so it seems that at the same time, America has this narrative of its rightness, in fact, as a victor in the war, a justa causa, post facto, post facto simply after the fact. And it seems that simultaneously, the nations over which America triumphs and therefore gets to impose a justa causa are no longer recognized as nations capable of declaring war at all. They lose, in fact, this formal equality. The only way, or at least I think a very good way to understand this, is through Schmidt's concepts. This play between justus hostis and justa causa. This is how I think we can understand actually America's victory in World War II. That if we simply said, oh, America imposed these things afterwards, we could understand it in terms of positive law, but we wouldn't understand the implications. We wouldn't understand, in fact, why it matters that Germany and Japan are no longer allowed to declare war after World War II. So my proposal to you today, the last thing I'll say, and then open this up for questions or allow you to leave, whichever you prefer, is this that it seems like what Schmidt wants to do is distinguish between the justus hostis, which he thinks is an actual formal and neutral way of determining just war. And this is a way of understanding war as it's happening. But if we read across Schmidt and Benjamin, who are in close contact and who are actually you know, writing to each other and thinking about these ideas, that when a war is over, we revert to this idea of justa causa. So just cause, Interestingly, who is right to go to war seems to be determined after the fact, i.e. not in terms of the rightness or in terms of the wrongness, but in terms of what? The victory or the defeat, according to Benjamin. Okay, so thanks everyone for your patience today. I know these are not easy concepts. And again, I'm not trying to say that this is the one way to understand um, just war today. It's, it comes from a very particular place, um, but I think that we can see that we are still struggling with this inheritance, that when we want to talk about justa causa today, who is right to go to war and who isn't, and we want to talk about just war in general, we inherit these terms, we have not overcome them. Thanks very much, everyone.